Welcome back. back. Welcome to Decision, Decision Space. Space, the only show to take place right here in the space between the turns in your favorite games. I'm Brendan Hansen. I'm Jake Friedman. And this is the podcast about decisions in games. And today we are going to be talking about elegance in games. What is elegance? It's a term that people use all the time, but clearly not one that we have a unifying definition of. I don't know that we're going to come to any final answers today, but it's going to be a really fun what we talk about episode where we can sort of discuss elegance in gaming generally. And perhaps there'll be some learnings that come out of this conversation. Yeah, we'll also discuss some game examples of games we think are elegant, some game examples of games we think are inelegant to kind of ground ourselves in the conversation. But we'll start the show with definitions. Before getting into that, I know we have a little bit of housekeeping. So I want to take the pre-planner side of things, Jake. Which is just to remind everyone, the upcoming game deep dives that we have, we'll be covering Coloretto and maybe taste dipping our toes into Zuloretto next week. Uh, and then coming up sometime soon in the future, we'll also be covering Brush, which is a very heavy Euro game about building things, uh, building things in front of your friends' things. And sometimes making water to produce energy. But mostly it's about building things, I think. That's going to be a great episode. And the last bit of housekeeping is actually a very exciting announcement. Something that we have been hinting at for a while. And it is officially happening. Brendan is going to be coming to St. Louis in May for the Geekway to the West convention. Taking place on May 18th through May 21st. This will be the very first time that Jake and I are in the same physical space together, despite spending hundreds and hundreds of hours in digital spaces together. So I know Jake and I are both really excited for that. But we also wanted to put it out there to our audience and say that if you are interested in attending a convention this year, uh, to let you know that both Jake and I will be there. And we'd love to meet and play games with members of the Decision Space listening community. Geekway to the West is a pretty cool convention and that it's mostly focused on playing games. There's a really large, massive library of games and it's a very small expo hall. So it's not your sort of, if you think of a convention like Gen Con or maybe PAX Unplugged, where it's mostly about those vendors and then also about playing games. Geekway is really a big room where people get together and play lots of board games. Yeah, and we're just going to be playing games the whole time. So we would love to play games with you. So if you're planning on going or thinking about going, talk to us about it in the Discord. Uh, We're going to try and organize a a meetup. So maybe find time to like grab a meal together. um, And then, yeah, just play tons of games together. So if you've ever been listening to this podcast and thought, hey, it'd be fun to play a game with Jake and or Brendan, this is the time to do that. So really want to encourage everyone to come and just hang out with us. It's going to be an awesome time. And I am so thrilled, Brendan, that you're going to make the trip down Uh, a long time coming for sure. It's going to be so fun to play games together. This is so not the space for this conversation, Jake. But would you you ever play Sidereal Confluence? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I I played it. I played it once before. Oh, and yeah, amazing. the con setting is perfect for that. You'd play it again, definitely. Yeah, I had okay, a great so time. So no cosmic, it. but totally we could play Sidereal Confluence. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, TBD. I mean whatever. I'll play anything, but yeah, Ugh, we'll my we'll be cl- starting now, right? Maybe we'll create a Geekway channel where we can see you know anybody who's coming or thinking about coming can hop in there, and we can talk about what we want to play and. and you know, find players, organize games, and it's going to be great. I'm very excited. But today, from here on, I think it's all about elegance, right? An inelegant conversation about elegance. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited for this conversation, Jake, because we haven't done a, de- a What We Talk About episode in a- quite some time. And we haven't done a What We Talk About episode just based on Let's talk about a word and how it gets used in the board game community and even longer, right? Like some of the more recent what we talk about episodes were kind of us trying to parse out a concept that we've identified and to delve into why we think that's a concept that's worthy or a lens worthy of putting out there. But I'm kind of excited because we did not invent the idea of elegance. Uh, We did not pluck it from the ether. There are real definitions that we can use as our guiding light uh, in this conversation. And I think that Sometimes people use these uh, elegance to discuss board games in ways that maybe don't perfectly align with these definitions, but I think they're a really solid starting point. So we can kick off from the dock of these definitions as we sail into this conversation. What do you think, Jake? 
I think I think that sounds great, and I feel like you know this is going to be an episode where we're going to disagree a lot, unfortunately. And I, you know, I feel I'm just bracing myself to be wearing the hat of the person saying, "I don't know if that makes sense, Brendan. <laughs> Explain yourself." I think that that's always really helpful, especially in terms of teasing out definitions. And maybe this is I wanted to say this later in the show, but perhaps it's more natural here that I think that one of the areas that we might end up disagreeing some um, is that I think that there are elegant games and inelegant games, right? Where a game can be completely elegant. As a unit, the game overall is elegant, but there are also inelegant games with elegant systems. And I think that sometimes where people's lines get crossed is they might have a game that they really adore, that's a somewhat heavier game that has one really elegant system. So they say, oh, that's a really elegant game because of that elegant system. And maybe some of what we'll try to parse is like the difference between what's an elegant game and what's a game with an elegant system? And why Why are those different things? Maybe. Jake's yeah. already shaking his head. So Let's get into it. Start. Let's start with definitions. the definitions. Yeah. Yeah. So we have two here. And why don't you say sort of the definition first that you have listed that you've sort of been going with. And then I want to add on with why I think this second definition is also useful in the conversation. Awesome. Okay. So the two that I kind of found are one is that elegance is beauty that shows unusual effectiveness and simplicity, more of an aesthetics definition of elegance that you might use to describe art or dancing, right? Or music even. Um, And then the second one that I really want to know is that elegance is the quality of being pleasingly ingenious and simple. So I think those are great definitions that get at a lot of what elegance is. The Third definition that I have here, it more speaks to what the word elegance evokes for me when I think about elegance outside of board games, right? If somebody says, what is elegant? And this is coming, you know, from my own biases and worldviews or whatever. The first thing I think of is maybe like a ball gown or something, but like sleek, like a dress, like a piece piece of clothing or, or maybe an individual that exhibits, you know, style and grace so the the definition i really like which i think is helpful in the board game context as well is pleasingly graceful and stylish in appearance or manner and i'm gonna posit that as we get into this conversation about what elegance is and noting that it's going to come down largely to personal preference and taste that a significant amount of what we individually find as elegant and perceive as elegant when we're playing games is sort of this style is that there these mechanics and solutions to problems in game design were done in a stylish way and i think that actually takes us pretty far in in my own understanding of how i've been thinking about elegance that's awesome i just want to take a minute to highlight what you just said too which is that Uh, basically what we're doing is we're having a conversation on aesthetics, which means that we're talking about what we find beautiful or ingenious or pleasing, and that that's inherently pretty subjective. Like what I think is elegant might be different than what you think is elegant. Uh, So I guess what we're talking about is a conversation about what things most people might find Mm -hmm. elegant, (laughs) right? Sounds very, very useful. But I do think that there are some, you know, sort of, overarching themes that we can get into that speak to what many people will find elegant in games if that makes sense right yeah absolutely like what are the the elegant traits that you might find sure so opening up about games more generally so i think within the context of games um one way to think about how people typically use the word elegance is that it's about making a lot of game, a really robust decision space with lots of depth and interesting decisions with a relatively simple rule set, right? So there's not a lot of complex rules overhead, but the game that emerges is actually quite expansive and large. And that's an elegant implementation of rules that sort of typically you might perceive a game like that to be ingenious in the way that it's simple, but creates all this depth. Yeah, and would you say that is this sort of catchphrase that a lot of people love to apply to their games, easy to learn, lifetime to master. I think that is sort of the publisher or whoever say, like trying to say like, this is elegant. Like if they put that on the box, that's what they're speaking to. Yeah, I think, I think so. I think that cliche is totally saying this is an elegant game. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So to continue these thoughts, I think that the other big thing is that 
the ingenuity of a system feels pleasing when a game is elegant, right? So it, it's that sort of thing where you're learning the rules to the game and you sort of say, oh, that's really clever. That system makes so much sense. I never would have thought about that, but it's so interesting. And if it's, especially if it's a simple system. So I think we're going to save a lot of the examples for the end, but I just want to mention one at the top. Yeah, I think so we the have one to that, get, get into some examples into as some we go. Yeah, one that jumps out to me as being the perfect example of this. And maybe it's because it's one of the first times I remember experiencing a game mechanic and it feeling elegant in, in sort of my modern journey with board games is the pandemic system uh, with the deck where essentially pandemic is this game where disease cubes are spreading across the board, right? And you shuffle up, uh, you're revealing cards from this deck. And whenever you reveal a card, uh, disease cube is placed in a certain city. And eventually you get to one of these really bad cards that causes uh, even worse things to happen. But then you shuffle that deck of cards up and place it back on the top. Uh, of the deck and then you start over again and what that means is is that the cities that were previously active will remain active and you know that uh you're gonna have to deal with the outbreak of disease in the cities that you've already seen again before you get to new cities so that's a really elegant way of sort of structuring the game around sort of disease continuing to perpetuate in the spaces where it exists as diseases happen naturally within the world but it all comes out of this really rich simple mechanism of just shuffling up the deck and putting it back on the top boom elegant simple do you agree is it elegant i i definitely agree with this one and to me i think what that speaks to is that this mechanism right the way the deck works here is doing mul- it's serving multiple purposes for the game in very important and very successful ways right it's both really makes sense intuitive sense with the theme right that if there's been an outbreak in one city it's likely that it's going to expand out from there type of thing um and it's a rule that makes the game interesting to play from a decision space perspective right because instead of it just being random anything can happen you know, you can formulate a strategy around this. So, you know, to hit both of those points with one rule is quintessentially, I think, elegant. I think that's a great example to start off with. Do you think, Jake, that there's a way that you could make a a complex mechanism that addresses multiple sort of things within a system, but isn't done elegantly? Like, I think you could make a pretty specific rule that kind of tries to get at two different things in a game that adds even more rules overhead that isn't implemented quite as elegantly. So for me, part of the ingenious of this is exactly what you said. It's solving, it's create, it's creating this depth in the decision space. It's doing multiple things at once, but it's also simple. It's not, it's not creating undue rules overhead. That is like this edge case that sticks out of the rules in this weird way. It solves multiple problems, but you're like, oh, this is a really simple rule set, except it has this rule that is just completely shoved in there from the side um, and done so kind of inelegantly, as I described it. Yeah, that that is an important point to make here too with this entire conversation. As we've already said, and we should probably stop reiterating, <laughs> elegance is going to be subjective to every single person. And what I think that means is that without an objective definition that's always going to be elegant, all of these examples that we're talking about and and are speaking to things that are more likely to be elegant, right? A rule is more likely to be elegant if it's uh, achieving multiple purposes in the Mm. game. It's more likely to be elegant if it's a simple rule. You know, it's it's more likely to be elegant if uh, it has like a stylish hook as a part of it, right? That that people can really cling to and it helps them understand the game and remember the game in future plays. But I don't think anything is in and of itself guaranteed to be elegant because it's always going to come down to like the implementation and the setting uh, and how all of these things come together. Do you think Jake that a good example of one of those stylish versions of elegant is something like the rule in high society uh, where the player who spends the most cannot win. Is that kind of what you're trying to get at is like is in your mind is that an elegant rule and an example of a stylish elegant rule? I I think I think that could be part of it. I'll give you the example that I was thinking about was actually a different Kinesia game and I don't think that you've played San Francisco yet. No. Nope. Um but I talked about it on our last episode or not the bonus episode, the prior one to that. Um and what I think is a really stylish elegant rule is that 
the way so in San Francisco, you're basically playing cards into a tableau, building up the city of San Francisco in front of you. And then each card that you play is worth a certain amount of people points. But those people points aren't translated one to one in points at the end of the game. Instead, you'll compare your people points in each of your four sections of your city to everybody else's to score majorities. And then for the way that the actual game points work is if you win a majority in a region, you get something like two points. And then second is one and third is zero and fourth is minus one. So it, I, when I played that, I was like, this is really stylish and elegant because instead of a game where you could be scoring like, oh, it's 80 to 81 to 82, you've got, it's, mm. it just like brings everything down to a level where it's like, okay, I scored seven points and I'm the winner. And also, so it makes scoring, it's, it, it honestly like increases the complexity of scoring because you have a whole extra rule set on top of it. But I think it makes all the systems like come together in a much more fun and interactive way. And I think it's just has that like, I don't, it's difficult to say, right? But it has like a sense of like, this is like an elegant Kinesia style to it, right? That we're all of a sudden it's, uh, you know, kind of like a low scoring affair, bring everyone closer together and making you care much more about what everyone else is doing in the game. Does that make sense at all? It does. I think what you're also describing for me is somewhat you're getting at that when you learn that rule, it felt somewhat ingenious to you that Mm -hmm. you wouldn't have thought that a rule could be set that way. And when you learned it, you sort of said, oh, that's really clever. And that that feels elegant to you for it being that way. Do you think that's fair? I think that's I think that's definitely a fair way of putting it. So I feel like some of what you're describing as, as stylish is also just a rule that feels clever. Like it feels like it's something that ended up in its place and it's clever that it ended up that way in the game. Maybe you wouldn't have thought to structure a game that way, or maybe it brings the game together in a way that is really sort of ingenious because it solves lots of problems and decreases the overall rules baggage while making the game more approachable. Um, But it actually increases rules baggage. I think that's kind of the difference here, right? And that's why it's stylish? I I don't know. Okay. I don't know what the definition of like stylish is, but I, you know, I kind of keep coming back to this idea with elegance, which is like, I know it when I see it, (laughs) you know, which is totally pointless for the podcast. But I think there is some sort of merit to that in in the sense where it, it is hard to put like, what is stylish? Like, what is beautiful? Right. I mean, that's sort of what you're asking me here. And it's sort of like, I'm not really sure that I can give you a definition and I don't think that this mechanism would work in any in all cases. And in many cases, you'd be like, why is there extra scoring on top of the scoring? That, you know, why do we need this? But in this one instance, when I was looking at it, when I saw that each of the tiles that you get, you p- get to pick up for your scoring are like different shapes and, you know, the... Mm point value i think they went from like maybe it was like two and a half to negative one was like the scale and all of that like taken together felt very cool to me and i thought it was you know just like an elegant way of putting it together um but it doesn't does not fit cleanly with the other definitions that we have so i think maybe that's why i sort of feel like stylish is an important thing to include in a definition of elegance or as part of a definition of elegance. I don't know. I think that I want to respond to that really quickly because I feel like partially. So for me, part of what elegance also means is that there's not a lot of edge cases. There's not a lot of things that stick out of the rule set fixing things. And if I'm mapping that onto your description of visual style, right, like a stylish dress or a stylish suit, I think that there's a harmoniousness to what I'm looking at when someone's wearing an elegant dress or an elegant suit where everything feels like it's perfectly in its place. It was considered as a whole and the individual pieces are also beautiful. And I think similarly with games, a stylish game might feel that way because a stylish, elegant game might feel that way because it's clever and because there's nothing sticking out in a, in a weird way. Um, Everything kind of feels like it's harmonious with what's going on, right? Like if I'm, if I'm putting together um, an outfit and I want to wear an elegant suit, the pieces are going to be harmonious together and work together. And I'm likely not going to have one piece of clothing that really stands out and jumps out. That might be an inelegant choice, right? If 
all of my like my suit, my shirt, my pants, my shoes were all matching. And then I was wearing this like really bright pink bow tie uh, with blue polka dots or something. And that clashed with the shirt that I was wearing. Maybe I would have a mostly elegant outfit with something that stands out and clashes. And I think sometimes games end up with rules that are kind of like that pink bow tie with blue polka dots where like everything else is mostly in its place. It's mostly harmonious. But then you have this one thing that really stands out and makes it feel not quite as elegant. Yeah, I totally agree with everything you're saying. And I think maybe that is sort of where I'm going with this like general like stylish conversation, which we can drop. But it's sort <laughs> of the idea that if somebody says like, like, Brendan, if you're wearing a dress, I'm like, wow, Brendan looks so elegant in that dress. Or if Brendan, you're solving a math problem and come up with a solution. I'm like, wow, that's an elegant solution to that problem. I don't think elegant really means like has a different definition in those two settings. It's sort mm. of speaking to the same trait. Oh man. I feel like we're going to get distracted <laughs> a little bit because I now I wanted to I think I inherently agree with you, but I think that for me part of the difference is somewhat that I could see a really elegant dress that was like full of fabric and really like just there's a lot there, right? Like it's not simple. It's yeah. busy. There's that's not el- then that's not an elegant shapes. dress. Okay, interesting. Right, now you're just describing a dress that you don't think is elegant. What if it was very, well, I do think it's elegant. What if it was really <laughs> flowing and, you know, it took up tons of fabric? To me, that might be different than sort of like an elegant math proof or something. I, I mean, yeah, possible. I don't know anything about math math proofs nor do i know anything about dresses so maybe so we, we should move here? on <laughs> yeah i i guess partially too that's that's what comes down to this being an aesthetics problem and when we compare mm-hmm. different applications of this different things feel elegant to us as humans in different contexts based on what that thing is trying to do so a dress being elegant is in comparison to all of the dresses that exist and then also all of their dresses that someone might wear in this context And then a board game being elegant is compared to our perceptions of what an elegant board game might be and what an inelegant board game might be. And again, I don't know a ton about proofs. I know a little bit. Uh, But I think also there's elegance is based on expectation somewhat. Mm -hmm. If you just looked at an object that you'd never seen before in a vacuum and, and you didn't know what that object was, I don't think you would have an ability as a human to say whether or not it was elegant because so much of why we think something is elegant is compared to similar things that are inelegant. And maybe there's exceptions. Maybe if you were viewing that object as a piece of art or something, but again, you're going back and comparing that to, oh, what do I perceive as aesthetically uh, elegant in art? Uh, Mm -hmm. Not whatever that thing is. So I think context matters. So if we're going to get into that and talk about what are elegant games, I think we have to... I think context is the key thing here, right? Where for me, like a style, like elegant speaking to like something that is stylish versus something else, right? Being like an ingenious and simple solution is like the ingenious and simple solution could be like applied more broadly where I feel like the San Francisco scoring system is like elegant in this situation alone, Mm. not inherently elegant because of being like a simple and ingenious solution to a problem if that makes sense i think that is kind of the distinction that that those two definitions have for yeah. elegance and i think that that goes back to my sort of idea where an elegant game often feels like it has all of the right rules in the right places um that mm-hmm. everything is kind of you know it's a it's a box that's been filled perfectly with things that like tetris like when the tetris pieces come together there's something that feels elegant about that to me of them all fitting perfectly into a square versus things sticking out. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's what you're saying with San Francisco. It's the right rule for the right place in that game. Yeah. To tie things together. So if this matters, right, Jake, if we're trying to talk about elegant games and comparing them to other games is how we can judge if they feel elegant to us, then I think we have to talk a little bit about what type of games don't feel elegant to us. Yeah. I think this is going to be, more clear almost right like it's very difficult to say that this is elegant but it seems a lot easier to me to say like this is not Mm. yeah totally and i think i really want to hammer home right now very loudly um that inelegant games that doesn't mean bad i think sometimes inelegant gets used to mean bad when people are using the word elegant and inelegant in board game spaces but i don't think that's true i think inelegant games are trying to accomplish other things than elegant games often i think inelegant games 
often are more likely to have large rules overhead. Uh, they're often more likely to have a set of rules that don't as intuitively fit together. And oftentimes that might be because they're trying to simulate something or model something, or they're trying to create a really um, large game that has lots of different systems that are fitting together. But maybe the point of that isn't fitting together elegantly. The point of that is exploring a complex system that's fitting together in an interesting way, but maybe not an elegant way. So two examples of what I mean by this. I don't find Root to be a tremendously elegant game. I think that Root has a tremendous number of rules uh, and oftentimes lots of edge cases and rules that fit together. And they come together uh, to create a system that's really interesting, that's really complex, but I don't know that it's super elegant in the way that it works. I think that's a great example of that. And honing in on edge cases, right? I think if a game has many edge cases, just in general, that's like, that is something that most people would find inelegant. Mm, um, yep. And again, you know, not not bad. Another game that came to mind to me when talking about inelegant games is Lost Ruins of Arnak. This is a game that you and I both really like, Jake. It's sort of a midway Euro game in which you're doing lots of stuff to try to move up a temple track, uh, more or less. And I think that nothing in this game really feels um, out of place, but it doesn't feel especially in place either in the way that you mentioned with San Francisco. Like it all is there but it doesn't fit to together in a clever way, more or less. It just fits together. And it creates this moderately complex uh, system that's fun to interact with and explore, but there's nothing that feels particularly ingenious about it. It feels yeah. like a somewhat straightforward game that's sort of saying, okay, this is a game about tempo and timing and go at it. Yeah, I think maybe an even better example, um, what you're... The way you talked about Lost Rune of Arnak right there just really reminded me of some of your criticisms with Living Forest of being like, mm. yeah, the game works and all the mechanisms are cool independently, but they just don't fit together for me. And yeah. I think that is a great example of a game that I don't, I, I really like the game, but I don't find that particularly elegant either because you essentially just have a deck builder and a pusher luck and then there's a rondelle there and they all interact slightly, but they're also like very distinct sections and phases of the game um yeah i don't know do you agree with that one yeah i totally agree i think that overall as a game it's fairly inelegant the one thing that i do think is elegant in that game is the little um the this is graphic design so it's so not important but you're sort of doing that push your luck mechanism where you're flipping cards off the top and when a certain number of them with a symbol come up you will bust more or less but there's versions of those that are the Instead of being black, they're white. I find that's a really elegant little graphic design thing. But overall, the game doesn't feel super elegant to me. I agree. Yeah. So I have a question, Jake. Do you think now we're not talking about what is an elegant game, but maybe like a symptom of an elegant, elegant game? Um, do you find that for you, games that you think are elegant, their rules are easier to remember after playing them for longer than an inelegant game? I do think so. I, I mean, if after not playing the game for a significant period of time if i can get it out and i'm basically already know how to play um or can just like quickly intuit what is happening mm. based on my previous plays to me that speaks to the fact that this is probably a pretty elegantly designed game maybe that's just the sort of opposite of the edge case thing right edge cases are usually the things that are difficult to remember like what happens when i have this power and i go to this particular space like i know there's a special rule for that like yeah. that's not going to be the type of thing um that i'll probably remember after not playing a game for six months but you know compare that to a game like the castles of burgundy where it's like okay yeah you roll the dice and then you have four actions you can do right like the core of that game to me is super elegant right so simple um you know, I think there's a good case to be made that overall the game isn't like a completely elegant game because you have all these different science tiles that you likely would have to look those up. But you could pick it up and just start playing right away and then say like, OK, I'll just look up all the science tiles that come out as they come out. Yeah, I had as I think now we're kind of pivoting more into talking about games. Um, and I had the Castles of Burgundy, which you were just talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. as an honorable mention because so much of the game feels really elegant to me the way that scoring happens the way that scoring 
uh, regions, the benefits for finishing them decrease as the game goes on. The way that all of the spaces and the way that you place tiles are tied to pips on dice, that you're rolling dice that also affect your ability to select things. The elegance of that game is the way that dice get used as a language to describe what you can do as a player and then create lots of interesting, meaningful considerations outside of that because of how dice work and assumptions that we can make on them. Those feel really elegant. But I agree that science tiles are just sort of the system bolted onto it that makes it feel less elegant as a game overall. So I think there's a simpler version of Castles of Burgundy that is a really elegant game. But the Castles of Burgundy itself is sort of a mostly elegant game with a couple inelegant systems that amp the weight of the game up overall, but decrease its elegance. Yeah, and I think I'm remembering correctly that Castles of Tuscany essentially is that. I don't believe there's science tiles in Interesting. Tuscany at all. Or or there are, but they just like increase one of your the strength of one of your few actions. Mm. And I think it's a worse game because of it, right? Like a lot of the intrigue and fun of playing the Castles of Burgundy over and over again is getting to experience different of the science tiles that then inform your strategy and um, give you some more fulfilling and fun variability as you play. So I think that is sort of a case study in in elegance doesn't always equal bad. And in fact, I think maybe it's often a good thing and it speaks to a designer having the courage to put in a rule that, you know, is potentially adding complexity because it's creating a more fun experience for players, right? Um, yeah. I think also, at least, you know, when we were talking about this, Jake, preparing for the episode, there's a lot of conversation of this idea, like, obviously an elegant game can be bad, but not a ton of elegant games that are get, are bad get published. And I think one of the reasons why that is, is, well, I don't want to talk about the publishing side, but elegant games are interesting from a design perspective because designing an elegant game can feel a little bit like discovering systems that work well together. And then if there's core balance issues within that elegant, really elegant system, it can often be hard to fix them without bringing in an inelegant solution, right? right? So if you have a core system that feels like it fits really perfectly together, except there's this scoring issue, one of the only ways to fix it might be to make it a more inelegant game. So when designers design are trying to design elegant games, they have fewer tools uh, to create a balanced system without making it inelegant. So I think that's the tension a lot of times in design is how elegant can I make this game while still having it feel like a, a fair game that people are going to enjoy from that perspective. And then once you start adding on rules, when do you stop, right? Because like yeah. now that you've taken one step away from like the super elegant core idea to add this scoring rule, think, well, maybe I should tweak something else too, right? Because I, I feel like, an Ill, a very streamlined, elegant game with like one or two things that doesn't hit exactly right could also be almost the worst of all worlds, you know? So it's like, oh, they like did this, but they could have done something with this over here. <laughs> Why because did it, they, if they're already sort of, you know, adding these things? It like really stands out. Just yeah. opposed to the rest of the game. If you have one edge case rule, it's like, oh, this system doesn't really work. They had yeah. to fix it with this broken thing. Whereas if you have lots of, yeah, totally. And the uh, last thing I want to say on inelegance is not a bad thing, which I just thought of now is, and it was because you made the point too, that like elegance really is con contextualized by what we know and what mm. we expect, right? Because we yeah. played a bunch of different deck builders, we can see that this one is really working elegantly. You know, same with worker placement or any type of mechanism or any type of, you know, light games in general or heavy games in general which you probably have to compare independently of each other to determine what's elegant um i think that games that are really on the cutting edge you know mm. if a designer is really trying to do something new that's probably not going to be read by the masses or board game reviewers as an elegant game i'm kind of thinking of you know, Jim Felly, who did Cosmic Frog, who's sort of thought of as a weird designer and, and doing weird and interesting stuff with his game. You know, Cosmic Frog, as I played that, it didn't feel like a particularly elegant experience to me, but it's also 
like so one of one of all mm. the games that I've played that I have no frame of reference for that whatsoever. It's the same with like the the gowns, right? We know what elegant gowns are so that if somebody wears something like totally weird to the red carpet. Yeah, we're back on elegant gowns to the ball, right? That person who's like wearing like the really crazy dress or whatever, like they're trying to do something. They're trying to achieve something else with that, right? It's like yeah. the Paris Fashion Week stuff. Like that stuff, when I see it, doesn't look particularly elegant to me because it's like all just like new and it just reads as like, wow, that's a really weird thing to wear. Is that fashion? <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. But and I think the point that you're sort of hinting at, but maybe not making explicitly is with the case of Cosmic Frog, if other people adopted this game uh, system, this idea of what's happening there you could probably make a version of a game like that and have it be feel elegant by comparison with mm -hmm. taking a lot of the same systems yeah that's that's really inter interesting but maybe if t if you accomplish that and then you took a step back and said is this an elegant board game you might still say no yeah or you'd be yeah. like I, yeah i made the simplified elegant version of cosmic frog that seems very doable by from a just like a design goal right if that's sure. like your guiding whatever yeah i'm gonna create the simplified elegant cosmic frog i think that'd be very doable but is that going to be more fun than cosmic, than cosmic frog, frog to the people yeah. who enjoy cosmic frog now that's going to be probably very difficult to accomplish to create a more elegant and more fun cosmic frog now you know we're talking about something that might not be achievable or at least not to most totally Sh surely yeah yep now, I think let's just keep talking about game examples. That's going to be really helpful. And then we'll sort of close with some bigger ideas. But uh, maybe we can start with just games that we think are elegant overall. And one that comes to mind for me is Azul. Azul has a really simple rule set. Uh, some of the scoring can be a little tough to wrap your mind around before you start. Uh, or excuse me, as you're learning the game. But once you know it, it, it kind of sticks with you. Feels fairly elegant. It also, for me, has something that I think is likely to produce something that feels more elegant in games, which is that Azul has this mathematical elegance. There's five tile types and there's a five by five grid on your board um, that you're trying to fill in. And the game ends when one player has completed a row of all five of those types. To me, that structuring around that five uh, helps the game feel even more elegant. Then it's a really relatively simple set of rules that creates lots of meaningful and interesting ways that you can interact. And I think the most elegant aspect of Azul to me is the fact that when you're uh, when you're playing Azul, you're drafting tiles from a shared display. And when you can always only draft one color. And when you do that, uh, when you take them from any one location, the rest of the remaining colors go to a central location that's another location you can take from. So to me, that's sort of the elegant mechanism that ties Azul together. And then some of the other mathematical elegance of this game is what makes it feel like a very elegant game to me. Yeah. And it also is a stylish object, right? Mm. I wonder if like, as we're having this conversation, something that keeps creeping into my head is that like art presentation and thematic integration are both things that probably weigh into the equation of elegance beyond just the mechanisms and i think azul is widely thought of as an elegant game and it also has just a really great and distinct look to it with the tiles uh and the in the component quality at least of the tiles maybe not so much the boards being like really off the charts so yeah i, I agree i think the mechanisms are elegant and i think that it is sort of like amplified by the art and you know component quality and presentation of the game. I think that's so interesting because I totally agree with you and see what you're saying. More people in this world say Azul is elegant because of how it looks. But I also think as a thought experiment, you could make a really ugly version of Azul. Like if the prototype was just made with paper, that would be terrible. And maybe you put monsters on all these different things. I think ludologically, the game itself would still be elegant, but yeah. overall it wouldn't feel elegant. And I think yeah, that, you'd be like, this is like it's some elegant mechanisms, but I think you would find it a lot less fun, probably, if you were just playing Azul with like construction paper clippings. Yeah, which kind of takes us back to the fact that it's really hard as humans to divorce how games look mm -hmm. and how they feel from how we experience them. Yeah. Okay, next game, trick taking game, two players. One of my favorite games of all time, a game Jake feels meh about, is The Fox in the Forest. So The Fox in the Forest 
is built around this core idea that you use a shared deck of cards. Uh, and each of you, when you're playing this trick-taking game, playing Suits Out, uh, are trying to figure out if you're in a position where you're trying to win the most suits, uh, if you're, excuse me, if you're gonna win the most tricks, or if you are gonna try to lose all the tricks on purpose. So it's basically structured around this tension between figuring out what type of hand you have compared to your opponents. Uh, and then there's also these powers on cards that are only on the odd value cards. So I can't remember exactly, but I think it's one, three, five, seven, nine, and 11 are cards in the Fox in the Forest that all have some sort of special ability. And I've, all of those special abilities also apply to those values of cards across suits, which I find, I find that something about that mathematically feels elegant to me, Jake, that it's just the the odd value cards that have the powers and that they're same across suits, that feels elegant. And then to me, the fact that you're drawing from this relatively small deck of cards uh, where there's mostly, they're shared information because it's from the same deck. I know the cards that are in my hand. Over the course of the game, I will learn about the cards that are in your hand. And then there's a few cards not in the deck. That feels like a really elegant use of the components that are there that creates a much richer game than might exist otherwise. But the the most important thing about the elegance of Fox and the Force to me is the scoring mechanism. That is what makes it an elegant game in my mind. So I think that like trick-taking games are inherently elegant for some reason. I think that speaks to the fact that they're right, it, it's I, I can't divorce it from what I know about them, right? That they're games that are often just played with a standard deck of cards. I think games that can be played with a standard deck of cards is, is a pretty elegant design goal, sort of, as is. Um, and, you know, they uh, they often have so much more depth than meets the eye uh, when you first learn the rule set. And, and in fact, a lot of that depth is going to be invisible to you until you really start getting into it. So I think that also kind of has that easy to learn, lifetime to master feel. Where I'm kind of pushing back is like, what is it about the scoring that is that makes it elegant? Like to me, that is like, if anything, it's like a stylish thing. Mm. I think for me, the reason why that feels elegant is it's a simple rule. Reference this card based on the number of tricks that you've won, and here's the number of points that you get. But what it the amount of um, the way it shifts the game to being much more in each other's head, much more psychological, and how I approach revealing information starts to matter so much more. So it's this like small twist on scoring, but it completely kind of reframes the game around it in a way that makes the decision space way more nuanced and interesting than if it was just about winning or just about losing something like that. Like the tension of existing in that space is what feels elegant to me. Okay. Yeah, I can, I, that makes sense. I can get behind that a little bit. Okay. <laughs> or com it makes sense completely, completely behind it. Let's see. So I think the next game here is one that definitely feels elegant to me. And that's Lost Cities by Reiner Kinesia. It's just a number on card games where you're trying to uh, create expeditions. We've done an entire episode on it. It's a game that Brendan and I both enjoy a lot. And I think I think the elegance here is basically the same as what I was just talking about with trick taking games, where it just has this like incredible emergent depth. Um, as you play more and learn how to play more that a lot of you know at first it feels like a game where you're just kind of like randomly playing or you just mm. you know okay i've got a low number so i might as well just play it right away um but as you sort of understand the game more get better at it you really have to start thinking about okay what opponent what cards does your opponent possibly have what type of cards are they looking for uh, how likely is it that X, Y, and Z is still in the deck for me to draw? That's going to increase my overall point potential. So like I'll waste getting three points here or potentially even giving my opponent those three points for a net gain of six to draw one card in the hope that it's one of the wager cards in a color that I need. Is that worth it? Uh, and it, like the decision space really explodes in terms of intrigue as you play it more. So I think very elegant. I think oftentimes whenever there's something you can do in a game that you know is something you can do, but the rulebook never says it explicitly, that often to me is a signal that that game might have either an elegant mechanism or is elegant overall. And something in Lost Cities that is there, what I'm referencing, is the fact that you can cover up cards in the shared display by just putting down a card. So I can sort of, if you know the six, the red six is down on the bottom of the table, 
and I want that red six, um, I could potentially cover it with a red two, knowing Jake has already played the red five, so he can't go back and play the red two. So maybe I'm covering the red six and putting the red two down, knowing I'll just come back for them later. Uh, I think that to me feels like a pretty elegant system that emerges out of these really simple rules of you can put down cards on stacks, but the consequences of what that is uh, is much more interesting. I will say, just because I think someone's going to say this, there is that rule in Lost Cities where if you get X number of cards of a certain color, you get some number of bonus points. That's like such an inelegant addition that to me, that's the one little thing that sticks out. And it's inelegant to the point that you and I even miss that rule. Miss that it exists. Yeah. It, it, the game doesn't need it at all, yeah. it feels like. So that's kind of a weird case where, I mean, I, I obviously, you know, Kinesia felt as though that was important for a balancing. For yeah. Right. So he added in and I'm, you know, I'm not saying that he's wrong, but we played the game and enjoyed it a lot without <laughs> realizing yeah. that was a rule. So I wonder if if uh, the juice is worth the squeeze in adding that in there. It's sort of the perfect encapsulation of what we were talking about earlier, too, where you have to sometimes to balance an elegant game, you have to add in an elegant rule. Yeah. And we forgot it. What about this next one, Jake? Do you think that uh, Uwe Rosenberg's patchwork is an elegant game? It's elegant for all the same reason that all these other ones we've listed so far are in that it's very simple rule set. I think the uh, presentation of the game goes a long way, right? You see all the tiles encircling the board. You see your empty board and are just thinking to yourself, like, holy cow, how am I going to achieve the goal of finishing this? There's tons of emergent player interaction around the time track, right? And competing for tiles. Yeah, I don't know what's not to like about that from like an elegance in games perspective. I think that for me too, the tension between spending time to get buttons for your button economy versus uh, spending lots of buttons, like, like that core tension between those two things is so simple, but it creates such a an interesting nuanced game that I think for me, that's a lot of where the nuance is coming from. I don't think this game is presented particularly elegantly. So it's sort of an example of a game that feels more elegant than it looks. Maybe let's pause for a second because so we've done four games so far mm -hmm. that are all very light games. Yeah. All extremely well received and regarded in the hobby. You know, I think like, are we just saying that light games are more elegant it seems to me that we are, uh, you know, not to bury the lead, like like a, a, a light game that's in the board game geek top 250 or whatever is like probably an example of elegance. I think that it's way more difficult to have a game that's perceived to be heavy feel elegant because the burden on the rules all fitting together just is like explosive in the way that. It's multiplicative, right? Because every time you add a new system, the chances of those systems fitting together elegantly, I think, decreases. So mm -hmm. as games get heavier, the likelihood of everything feeling harmonious, of there not being edge case rules, kind of decreases. So I think it's easier for a light game to be elegant, but it's not that heavy games can't be elegant. It's probably just more likely that heavier games are more likely to just have elegant systems, but that overall they don't feel as elegant. Yeah, yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah, right. A game with 10 elegant systems, the chance of them all coming together to create a holistically elegant experience game. yeah, is really unlikely to the point of maybe people would argue non-existent, depending yeah. on how you, how you want to interpret that. Can we talk about Tigris and Euphrates? Because I, f I feel like it fits really well here. So Tigris and Euphrates is a game that I think is, for me, it's sort of an example of this where it's a heavier game, but, and it feels mostly elegant. Like the amount of richness that comes out of these really simple mechanisms of you have these tiles, place two tiles um, on your turn. You can create monuments if you create a square of four. Uh, overall, the weight and depth of that game to the rule set feels pretty huge to me. But I will yield that like there's a lot of inelegant little things like the rules about certain treasures that you can't that you have to take off the board or can't take off the board when you unite two kingdoms, even the way some of the even the fact that when you place a tile that starts a war, you don't get you don't score that tile in your color. Uh, I, I mean, Jake, you'd be better at going on about the things. Yeah, I mean, I, I think those are two of the key things that I, I find inelegant about this game. I think also for me. 
I, I think the game doesn't give me enough like visual like footholds to where mm. every time like we've recently been playing this game again with some people in the discord and I've like completely forgot how to play. You know, I couldn't like I mean, not completely, but, you know, we did two episodes on this game and like starting back up, I like was just lost immediately on the rules. Like it, mm. it's not at all a sticky game to me. So I think that to me, right, again, is something that I look for in an elegant game. Um, yes. How your leaders work, the implications of the red leader versus the black leader versus the blue leader versus the green leader, those certainly are elegant rules. Right, and know. they're so core to the game Decisions. itself. Yeah, yeah, so I don't know. I can't sit here and be like, here's 10 games that are of that weight class that I think are more elegant. Like I, yeah. you know, I do think it is a decently good example of elegance in that weight class, but like, I can't sit here with a straight face and just be like, Tigers Euphrates is such an elegant game because that just hasn't been my experience with it. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And it kind of highlights that somewhat maybe the perception of elegance is around this idea of like depth to complexity ratio. That's what I was going to say too, right? Like yeah. maybe that's the best definition for elegance we have is just, you know, weight to depth. I think, was it somebody in our Discord posted like that very thing as a formula? Yeah, was yeah, yeah. Saying, it was Cerule from the Board Game Duel podcast, which is a French language podcast. So if you speak French, check that out. I sadly don't, so, <laughs> but I, I'm sure it's great because Cerule has awesome comments frequently. And that was basically what he presented as a definition for elegance, which I think make I don't think that answers everything that we've talked about in this podcast. But I do think like if we wanted to propose a definition to be used unilaterally to say like, this is what we're talking about when we say elegance. It's hard to come up with something better than that, but that's not at all what we're proposing <laughs> to be clear. It's definitely like on the way, but it's missing. You need an air term in there. Plus, plus E in the equation, the air term being things like how well does it feel like these rules are fitting together? How ingenious does it feel? Because I think a, a relatively does simple... Does it fit with the theme? Like right. the pandemic example, right? Like yeah. that advances the theme and the gameplay. Totally. Yeah, definitely. Uh, can we name... Jake, That's we're getting the style. Close. That's, That's the, style. the style component. Exactly. Okay, so I want to ask you if this... Let's talk about some mechanisms that are elegant, but maybe elegant mechanisms and not games that feel ele elegant overall. So... This one uh, has always stuck with me as being a really elegant rule, which is that in Dominion, you know, you're racing to build this deck of cards and you're building essentially this engine um, that you're then going to turn into collecting victory points at some point in the game. But the way that you when you buy victory points, those cards go in your deck and they're going to slow your engine down. I've always found that that scoring system is super elegant. That rule elevates the whole game in a way that it changes the implications of all of the decisions that you'll make because it becomes this timing puzzle around okay when do i think my deck is good enough to buy victory points and can i outrace the other players once i start doing that and start making my deck worse worse by adding in those victory points do you think that's a stylish mechanism elegant you mean yeah well in this case i was asking you about <laughs> stylish but do you think it's elegant as a starting point yeah definitely okay. um i think the right it it is advancing the end game condition and also like the gameplay experience of it too, of sort of slowing things down as you get to the end, sort of holding people on the edge of their seat a little bit, sort of the Jenga deal where, you know, the game is like, as you play, the tension is rising and rising and then it sort of like holds you there. Like that's a very elegant game system of stacking the block back on top so that the downward pressure makes it, easier to potentially get out some of the blocks that early on in the game would have been impossible to retrieve. This is another like doing two things at once, or solving multiple problems, or this isn't really solving problems, but creating multiple implications through a simple rule. I feel like that's so much of the trick of elegance too, for me, just like, that's what feels ingenious is it's, it's sort of that's like the ingenious component of it is right. Solving multiple problems at once. Yeah. You learn the rule set and you, before playing the game, you can't imagine the implications of the rule. Usually when that happens, I feel like it's going to end up feeling elegant. Not always, but you, well, I think that's like two things at once. Yeah. Yeah. I don't okay, know. Wait, we talked about the pandemic deck. What about the welcome to bell curve? So in welcome to it's a flip and write game where there's a deck of cards 
that have values between one and 13, I think, but the values are just distributed in a, like in a bell curve, like D six would be two D six that you're rolling would be. So, you know, that an eight is more likely to come out of the deck than a one or a 13. That's really simple. Uh, but to me, feels like a pretty elegant mechanism in terms of you being able to not track what cards have come out and still have more or less of a sense of what's likely to come out. Do you yeah. think this counts, Jake? I do. And I it feels like maybe something different than what we've addressed before. Maybe kind of getting at the easy to get out and play again after a long time. Something along those lines. But I think it creates like a more intuitive play experience. Game. Yeah. Of n- with no additional rules overhead, right? Yeah. So the way the deck is designed makes the game much more intuitive to play and you don't even have to add any rules. That's so huge. You're so right. A huge part of why that game, why that system feels elegant is just that it's intuitive. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's another one. El Grande's card system. You start with a full hand of cards. Every turn you play one of them. And the thing about these cards is there's a tension between you want to play high value cards because those let you pick your power on the table Uh, that's essentially being auctioned off versus but if you play those high value cards you don't get to add many of uh caballeros cubes to your court but if you play a low value card you say okay i'm gonna pick last in power i'll play the one and then i get to add just a boatload of caballeros to my to my uh court i think that the initial rules learn of that is pretty inelegant but its consequences on the game overall feel quite elegant to me. I think it's this interesting tension, again, maybe where this one system is load-bearing in a way that feels really clever and boards yeah. out a more interesting game if it was replaced by a more complex system. Yeah, I struggle with this one a little bit, I think, just because I really love this game, and I think that this is, uh, in many ways, sort of like the heart of the game, right? It's like the auction yeah. of this sort of like auction game with the area majority board um but i think so many games have these interesting trade-offs too yeah they like, aren't elegant it, games yeah yeah like till till a tomb we played has like a mm. very similar type of deal with the uh dry, dice drafting portion where if you pick up the six you get six resource and one action point if you pick up the one you get one resource and six action points right so that has that like inherent trade-off Maybe that is just a really elegant system too. And yeah. Then the rest of the game <laughs> is uh, elegant. I didn't vibe with as much. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, I, I think so. Okay. So this, uh, yeah, I would, I would think it's in that same Tilla Tomb sort of category of like a really core, interesting system that drives the actions in the game. That's yeah. overall not the most elegant game. Yeah. I, I would yeah. definitely not put El Grande into the. <laughs> elegant game category it's not a beautiful flowing dress no no no, no. but it's cool i I'm like it. it's a chic dress a chic dress brendan that's what yeah. elegant means chic what <laughs> yeah. did i say beautiful flowing. beautiful flowing yeah. okay okay i mean that could be full i don't know maybe we have a different yeah this is our jake we have to, join us in a, a bonus episode where we discuss dress uh yeah we're adding aesthetics. say yes to the dress channel in our yeah, discord right away <laughs> what do you I'll think post about? a new dress every day like is this elegant and people will have to say yes or no totally as we wrap up this conversation i have one more game to just pose to you do you think that this mechanism is elegant so in cascadia cascadia is built on this idea that you have a habitat puzzle where you're building out terrain and then you're also putting animal into those habitats and you have Every turn you draft a pair, a randomly created pair of animal tiles and terrain. Uh, I find that that core mechanism of randomly juxtaposing a tile and an animal type is a pretty elegant way to create a fairly deep and interesting system. I don't. I think the scoring in Cascadia can be a little bit inelegant. There's lots of tie-breaking rules. You're sort of competing for majorities. The cards themselves, just points go up. But that core system, the drafting, I find to be a pretty elegant little system. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a very simple little system that gives you uh, multiple, like works towards multiple overlaid objectives simultaneously. So I think it creates a pretty interesting decision a lot of the time. I think if anything, the inelegant part of Cascadia is just comes from like the scoring cards, yeah. which sometimes is just like, wait what is happening here you kind of have to like wrap your head around like what the card is telling you and you have to like consult the rule book the first time and then maybe that makes it more clear maybe you have to go to the board game geek (laughs) for a little further explanation i feel Um, like that's insightful jake 
Because I think that what you just said in some ways is that elegant games are easier to keep in your head, which I know we've said a couple times throughout this episode. But in Cascadia, a game I've played a hundred times, oftentimes I have to look at the rules of a certain scoring card again while I'm, you know, just to see how many points I'm going to get and judge yeah. the decisions and compare them. Yeah. Yeah. One thought I had just as we're wrapping up, here's a random thought. I think Stefan Feld designs incredibly elegant games that have importantly uh, important inelegant rules added in like his best game. So I was thinking of Carpe Diem, which I feel like is his most elegant game super simple rule set has a very elegant i think mechanism of the scoring tableau there where you get to place a token mm. between two of the cards on the grid to score both of them creating like a little bit of like a competition for them and all that and you're just moving around uh, a rondelle to take cards but horribly inelegant system where like the tiles that come up in the last round are just like different right you have to have like a whole separate set of tiles uh so that all of them only have a building on one face, but it, that does such an important thing for the game. Like once you know it's coming, um, that you'll be able to like do a much better job predicting what you can finish and uh, mapping out how you how you'll complete your city. So like I feel like that is almost like core of his game design, like a very elegant core game system, like Castles of Burgundy, like Bruges, like Bonfire, with just like inelegant stuff tacked on that ultimately is what makes the game sing so yeah. anyway that's a random thought i had that i just wanted to put out there i think that that's so interesting because i never would have guessed stefan feld as being sort of of having elegant designs i think part of it is just that we both like stefan feld games some but when we were doing this castles of burgundy was one of the heaviest games i could think of that feels mostly elegant to me i think it's games feel mostly elegant because yeah the core systems feel elegant but I think they're easy nothing. to teach too i think that's yeah. a big part of it right because like on all of these games you can say like all right, on your turn, you can do like one of these like two to seven, whatever, depending on the game. Very easy to understand actions. Yeah. And then we're off and running and then we can sort of explain cards or science tiles or whatever as they come up. Yeah. But like the core action system in all these games is super simple. I think that's something that like I can grab onto and it helps me retain how to play them and get them to the table easier. Yeah. than equally weighted games by maybe a different designer. Totally. But at the same time, the stuff he layers on is usually very complex. And totally, not I agree. Elegant. Like in the Year of the Dragon, almost an elegant game, but all the different ways the people work makes it inelegant. Yeah. But the core I, system, quite elegant. Yeah, super simple, right? You're picking one of seven actions that, yeah. and that's it. Um, but yeah, okay. So I think that's sort of an interesting kind of case study in how a particular designer interacts with elegance. Maybe we could wrap up by just like trying to like reiterate what some of the ideas we've come to in this episode are that make up elegance. Great. Elegant games are games that do a lot with a little, very orderly in an ingenious way that is pleasing. Um, and... <laughs> Okay, yeah. so do a lot with a little, right? Do a lot so with they're a little. right doing achieving multiple like design objectives with one rule. Uh, games that have rules that are easy to retain in your head. What else have we said? I feel few edge cases. Few edge cases, right? So like all the mechan rule mechanisms fit together nicely. Um, they are games that often have single rules that advance both the gameplay and the thematic integration. Yep. Perhaps they can be designed in a way that creates a more intuitive play experience without any additional rules. Um, yeah, so I think that I think sort good. of speaks to it. Yeah, awesome. And, and, and games that have emergent depth beyond yes. what you think when you first read the rule. Yeah. And, and more likely to be found in simple, well-regarded <laughs> hobby board games. I think also I want to the final thing is I think that you could have emergent mechanisms come out of two really complex rules and that might be less elegant than a deep system that comes out of two relatively simple rules. I think the the complexity of the rules to the depth it creates is that important capstone that we should just shove on the top of the conversation and say yeah all that stuff together that's elegance. So right. 
That's Hopefully, style, baby. <laughs> yeah, that's style, baby. Hopefully, this you found this conversation to be interesting and useful. I know I found it to be really interesting. I hope that that informs the way that maybe you'll uh, discuss elegance going forwards and gets you a little bit closer to kind of understanding what maybe people might be getting at when they say a game is elegant uh, and all of the baggage that comes with that. Jake, I thank you so much for having this conversation with me. I'm really excited to discuss Colorado and way later on barrage with you as always like this is just the beginning of the conversation actually the conversation has already been ongoing in our discord so if you want to chime in and tell us how wrong we are about elegance how you define it we would love to hear that uh, you can as always join the link in the description of this podcast and i also wanted to just make a very quick appeal for reviews if you're still with us for this long thank you so much for listening to our show and if you could take 30 seconds to just leave us a review wherever you are listening to this podcast right now. That would mean a ton and help us out a great deal as we continue to try and grow our show. Yeah, we haven't had a review in a long time. And I want to know if you do leave a review, you should say who's more elegant, Jake or Brendan. Have a great, great week, y'all. Oh, there's more at decisionspacepodcast.com. Check it out. Yeah. All right. Bye. Oh, that was so oh, inelegant. Oh. <laughs> okay, wait. Let's thank Hembry for our intro and outro music. Reach out and have a great week and have fun playing board games. Bye. Bye. No, no, no. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>